Thank you, Raj, for the honor and privilege to uh, come to the OP Jindal Global University. And uh, also would like to thank uh, Mr. Murthy Ji and uh, Srinam Chaudhya Ji and all the faculty members and uh, students. Uh, it's been since April of last year I'm entering the campus, you know, so it makes me feel good. So thank you for uh, attending this lecture and I'm happy to share my thoughts on the topic and hopefully you'll have a few questions as well. So let me thank for the privilege and honor to be here at OP Jindal Global University. And uh, I just came uh, from Bodh Gaya where I saw Mr. Dayaram was giving a teaching uh, on Kala Chakra where 2 lakhs or more than 200,000 people attended from 63 countries uh, including uh, 8,000 from Tibet and 1,200 from China with a passport from PRC and uh, uh, 10,000 also foreigners by which I mean to say I'm a little slow because after 10 days of prayer and meditation you know from morning till evening makes you feel more relaxed and good but at the same time Raj is putting me today through the test by inviting two of my professors here Professor M.P. Singh and Pramodan Singh so you know uh, any student's uh, nightmare is to stand before your teachers <laughs> and give tests. So, honored to be invited here, but a bit of a complaint now. Putting, I have to pass the test, so to speak, by giving this lecture. But uh, uh, really great to see Professor M.P. Singh and Permanent Singh. Through them, I learned a lot. Uh, and uh, Professor M.P. Singh wrote my recommendation letter to uh, Harvard Law School as well. So, if anyone is looking for recommendation, <laughs> you, have, you have two here. And the campus is set up, I must say, it's a beautiful campus. And this auditorium is set up like, you know, Harvard Law School. Uh, with much better though, actually, because uh, much newer. So, beautiful campus and excellent facilities. And uh, congratulations to the law school. I'm not being biased, but it seems Ernst and Young did a survey and uh, recognized it as two of the uh, best schools uh, in India. Uh, and all this uh, happened in two years' time, the whole construction, everything. So, you know, this is OP Jindal uh, Global University is uh, uh, really one of the rare model or example of how things can be done in India. Um, really, congratulations. Now, as for the topic, uh, democracy in exile in the case of Tibet. Uh, perhaps I should start with myself, uh, then, because I do represent both, as Sir Nam was talking about, Aung San Suu Kyi's you know, article about power and passion. I also fall in the lat latter category. Uh, perhaps my brief story will reflect that, being born in exile and democracy as well, because now I am the elected Kalun Tripa, but my upbringing background uh, uh, has been bit from a humble background, so to speak. I grew up in a, I was born and brought up in a place called Lama Hata in, in Darjeeling area. Uh, actually, it's between Darjeeling and Kalimpong. Anyone from West Bengal? Ah, Amarabari Darjeeling, Ashi. And uh, anyone who has been to Darjeeling or Kalimpong? Quite a few. But now, you too. But uh, then you know my village, Lama Hata. Have you been there? No? No, all of you have been there, but I'd rather pass by, because it's between Darjeeling and Kalimpong. So the place where they sell para or you know, radish or carrot, yeah, that's where, it's a very remote village. So even today, uh, and if you have to go to the Darjeeling town, there are four or five taxis or jeeps, old ones. And then you have to catch it between 7, 7.30 a.m. to 8, 8.30 a.m. If you miss those, then you have to come back home. 
and go the next day. Uh, or you catch this, uh, the jeep that comes every hour from Kalimpong, which goes to Darjeeling, but doesn't stop on the way. Unless there's a seat, you know, it's very difficult. So if you look up, it's all forest, and if you look down, it's all field. And uh, my parents had an acre of land, a couple of cows, and a dozen or so chicken. And uh, I spent a lot of my days, my winter vacation was mostly spent in forest, uh, fetching wood for house and uh, uh, grass for cows. Uh, and then uh, I remember uh, being in the hen house for that one egg to drop so that it'll be one dozen so that I can, can take it to the market and sell it. Uh, that's how I grew up. And I studied uh, in Tibetan refugee schools subsidized by the Indian government, so I owe, I owe a lot to India and Indian people. And then the, uh, the food condition we had uh, was, uh, you get obviously dal bath <laughs> for dinner, but the problem is every day just dal and bath every day <laughs> for dinner for 10 years. <laughs> no subjis. And uh, you, you have to be an expert you know, because you have to serve in turn. You have to carry two buckets, one for rice and one for dal, and you have to take turns to go to the kitchen to get dal and rice for your group. So you must have a you know, scientist's mind you know, or engineer's mind to take turns. Because everybody crowd in front, but nobody puts their bucket first. Why? Because if you get the top layer of dal, you just get water. <laughs> so you have to push so the other one rush and put their bucket first. But if you remain last, you get dal and sand, you see. <laughs> so you have to be right in the middle, you know. So, so you get street smart that way. Uh, and then the uh, lunch, we get dumpling and uh, sabji. Eat the radish for three months, potato for three months, a cabbage for three months. And the dumpling is not the one you eat in Chinese restaurant, you know. It's hard and dark. And uh, when you drop it, it bounces higher. <laughs> so only dumpling, that proves Newton's third law wrong, you know. <laughs> so that's how I grew up. And then, uh, uh, then went to St. Joseph College, went to uh, Delhi University, Hansraj. I was very active in the Tibetan student uh, organization, then Tibetan Youth uh, Organization, and uh, I was Vice President, General Secretary, and President of uh, Tibetan Youth, which is the largest and most active organization. And I still remember at Hans Raj College, uh, I asked my uh, you know, uh, class teacher to take off on 10th March. It's our National Uprising Day. I said, Mrs. Call, I have to take tomorrow off because it's tomorrow's National Uprising Day. And she said, no, as it is, you miss so many classes, you can't, day another, you can't take another day off. But I said, tomorrow is a national uprising day. I have to be there in front of you know, India Gate to have this demonstration and protest. She said, nothing doing. Anyway, as usual, I skip without permission <laughs> because you know, I have to do the necessary thing. So next day, it so happened that the Tibet youth group, they just got carried away. So they start shouting slogans, and there's a you know, barricade in front, and the Indian policemen. So some of you broke the barricade, started you know, running towards India. Again. Actually, if you run, you get tired, and you sit in somewhere. Like, there's no way to go. But then, you know, you're passionate. Sometimes passion will carry you. Passion is not always uh, rational. You know? So they, then there was Lati charge from police side. You can't break this barricade. You know? So they were started going. So Latis were coming. And I was trying to separate the two group, you know, uh, Tibetan youth group and the policemen. But the next day, in Times of India, in the Delhi section, the front page picture was Lati charge. I was right in the middle, you know. <laughs> 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 so on March 11th, I went to the class and Mrs. Collins said, oh, Lobsang, where is Lobsang? Where is I said, I'm here. How are you? How are you? I said, why? It looks as though all the Latis were coming on you, you know. <laughs> So next year, I got permission without asking. His call says, I know where you went, you know. So I was very active. And then uh, got Fulbright scholarship uh, to go to Harvard Law School to do my LLM, where Raj also uh, went. 
and then uh, did my SJD. So I spent the last 16 years at Harvard Law School in short. I got fellow and senior fellowship. Um, so I was a uh, walking dinosaur at you know, uh, Harvard. I could, I, I mean, there's some uh, faculty members from Harvard. And this, I'm from 2001 and 99, 2000. I get embarrassed because I've always been there for so long. Uh, so I was looking for a job, you know, new job. Uh, it so happened that Tibetans were electing Kalun Tripa. And uh, I jumped in. Uh, the story goes, okay, I'll come to this point. I, okay, I'll, I'll share the story now. Um, try to put it in context later, a little later. So the story goes like this. A year and a half ago, uh, name starts coming out in websites, nomination for candidates. So my name also came up. Then after some day, it became a bit serious. Uh, then I start, you know, uh, start thinking about running because as I said, 16 years at Harvard Law School, it's enough. Um, and I asked my friends, um, I said, look, names are, you know, my name is mentioned in websites. Some organizations also nominated me. I'm thinking, of, you know, I'm thinking seriously to run. And then it so happened the six other candidates were the former Kalun Tripa or former prime minister, speaker of the parliament, the deputy speaker, most seasoned diplomat, and private secretary or former private secretary of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. They are the other five. And I was the sixth one. The youngest, least experienced, never worked in Dharamsala, spent 16 years in America trying to parachute myself to Dharamsala. So obviously on paper, again, there's irrational choice theory here. Rationally, everybody, conventional wisdom was I had no chance. The other candidate, especially the former prime minister, was a shoe in So I asked my friends, you know, and say, hey, I'm thinking of running, what do you think? Uh, one friend, who, who is in Delhi actually, he says, are you serious? I'm, I'm serious. Then what you need first is a graceful exit strategy. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why? I said, look at these people, you know, former prime minister, speaker of the parliament, deputy speaker, all that, and then you, you know, spent 16 years in America, now you're thinking of coming and joining in. Okay, then the second guy, it was in New York. I asked him. Okay, he said, I'll give you an answer two days later. Two days later, he calls me. He says, Lopsang, I talked to all my friends in Washington, D.C. and in Dharamsala. That's where the Tibetan you know, uh, administration is based. None of them are voting for you. <laughs> so, you are my friend. Your friend, friends are not voting for you. And who do you think will vote for you? <laughs> And I was complaining to my third friend. I said, look, this advice, you know, look at this. This is the kinds of advice my friends are giving me, you know. What am I supposed to do? And I think he looked at me and maybe he felt really bad. And maybe, maybe compassion, you know, came about. He said, Lopsang, I think you have nothing to lose, so go for it. <laughs> so with that encouragement, you know, I went uh, to the Tibetan people and I called my friend who told me all his friends are not voting for you. And I called him and I said, I am going to run. And how, he said. I said, all my friends are not voting for you. I said, no, you're asking the wrong people. I said, who are you going to ask? I'm going to ask the real people in Tibetan settlements and all over the world. And I said, how? By going to the people. So as per Tibetan tradition, uh, you know, we don't have an election kind of a practice. Because, again, I'll come to the point, because part freedom movement, part democrat democratic government. So, so part member of parliament or a but they don't run, they don't go to the people, they don't ask for votes, because you're a freedom fighter. People have to ask you to lead, you know? If you're a politician, you say bread, butter, and shelter, you get votes. If you, are, if you go to Tibetan people and say, I'll bring you bread, butter, and shelter, they'll throw you out. They said, whatever the bigger cause, whatever Tibet and our freedom, you know. So then I, I was at the law school. Then I quickly rushed to Kennedy School. And I was taking crash course on election campaign. <laughs> Administration, leadership, communication, you know, so many courses one day, you know, one semester. Because after that semester, I should, I should be jumping in and running the campaign and leading the Tibetan movement, you know. So because I was mostly at the uh, law school by, uh, till then. So the election campaign, 
laws that you read in the campaign, the American style. I sat through the class whole semester and thought for a while. I said, if I run this model, I'll not get anywhere. <laughs> and I thought I had to formulate my own campaign formula. And I said, this is how it goes. I said, okay, I have to campaign without campaigning, ask for votes without saying, so that I will win even if I lose. So that's the formula. Now, how I form my own formula is if you say if you are campaigning without campaigning, what I did was I didn't go to the people promising bread, butter, and issue. I went to give workshops on the state of the Tibetan movement, you know, because knowledge is supposedly my strength, and I was showcasing my knowledge to the people. So I would give workshops and lectures on the state of the Tibetan movement, where we are, what we need to do. So I was campaigning without campaigning, right? So I have asked for votes without saying, how do I do that? At the end of my workshop or lectures, I always say, these are my ideas. If you like it, do remember. If you don't, just throw it away. I never ask for votes. I, say, I never say, please vote for me. So that the main challenge was this. With conventional wisdom, was I was losing. So I have to win even if I lose. Even if I lose this election, I have to win in the sense I have to remain Tibetan. So respect for elders, you know, not being too assertive, rather not being too individualistic, not being too, uh, you know, uh, brash. You have a sense of humility, you know, a sense of uh, uh, community. All this is very important. So even if I lose the election, I have to come out as, okay, he was respectful of the whole process. So that's the formula. And then I, and then I did. I used uh, my youth in my favor. It means I traveled to more Tibetan refugee settlements than any of the candidates. So I went to Ladakh, to Arunachal Pradesh, Meo, Bandra. Took 22 hours taxi ride. 22 hours taxi ride. And then spend the day, take train for 10 hours, spend the day, again, you know, take bus or taxi, things like that, across um, India. Again, now this Tibetan election, because Tibetans are scattered in 40 some countries, it's a diaspora, a diaspora community. So it's not, a, you know, it's not like a MLAU campaigning a district or MP, or not even a chief minister, you campaign statewide. Not even a prime minister, you campaign nationwide. You have to campaign continent-wide. From Asia, you have to go to Europe, you have to go to Canada, you have to go to America, and Australia. From Alaska to Australia, Tibet and sleeve. So you have to go to these places. I could not go all the places, but did go to Europe, uh, North America, and Asia. Um, very big challenge. Um, and then I got elected. Now, As you learn in leadership, leadership is a lonely place. It's a very, as it is being a political leader of the Tibetan people, is a very difficult job. And to run an administration without a territory or country is extremely difficult. Why I say leadership is a lonely place, and you might have read about increasing cases of self immolation. Uh, inside Tibet. Till date, I think 16 Tibetans have burned, set themselves on fire um, since March of last year. So the reports come to you saying one person or two have set oneself on fire. It's a very painful news. And then you get a trickle of news on a daily basis or someone then after some days or some hours, you get a name, then the age, then the family, then we compile a report, issue it. So what people read normally, and I'm sure many of you are not aware that this many Tibetans have you know, uh, self-immolated. Uh, but I have to. So as a human being, uh, you feel for these people. They are willing to die for a cause. They think it's worth, they think it's better to die than live. And then people expect me to do something about it. So that's why leadership is a lonely place, because then 
you look at the report and decide what to do. Then I decided to go to, uh, of course I was uh, uh, in Delhi, uh, talking to many leaders here. Then I decided to go to America, uh, to the US Senate and Congress, and meet people from the executive and from the media and intellectuals to make them aware of what's going on and have a resolution or maybe uh, give a testimony before the Congress. Then I sent a memo two months prior to the visit, November 1st to 5th. And on September 16th, my cabinet was confirmed by the Tibetan parliament. So that was the good news. As I was returning from the Tibetan parliament, entered my office, and I looked at the staff, and they were in a very bad mood. And I said, what happened? I thought we have good news because our cabinet just got confirmed. And they said, well, your memo to our office in New York was leaked to the public. So the memo had plans to meet people and you know, give testimony before the Congress, things like that. It was leaked deliberately exactly the same time when I was having good news. As I returned, it was leaked. Obviously, you know who intercepted that email country by the capital which starts from B. <laughs> Do I have to spell it? <laughs> so, and then the staff members were really nervous and they were saying, what to do now? Our secret is out. And I said, well, nothing. We'll follow exactly the same schedule. We'll try to meet the same people and we won't change a thing. Because, yes, we do believe in nonviolence. We do believe in dialogue. We want to reach out to the Chinese government to solve the issue of Tibet based on win-win proposition. Having said that, we will not be intimidated for what we do. We have to stand on our principle. We will not let them sabotage our efforts. So we have to not just double, triple our efforts. While I was in DC, I was trying to meet three or four more number of people than we have listed in the memo. It's just to send a message to Beijing that we will not be sabotaged, intimidated. And I did. By the end of five days, I lost my voice because I had like seven or eight you know, different meetings a day. And then I thought, you know, your, your media is important. And I thought of writing an op-ed for the Washington Post. Two days before my submission, Chinese embassy sends, a, uh, sends an email to the Washington Post not to publish mine. Two days before I submitted my op-ed to the Washington Post, they received an email not to publish my email, not, not, not to publish my op-ed. So that's good, because when I sent, Washington was already new, and by the, the, when they read, they were, they were willing to publish it, they did. So, again, uh, leadership is a lonely place. It's a difficult job. And to run an administration without a homeland is very, very difficult. And then increasing cases of self-immolations makes it very, very difficult. But then while you try to do something, and there are people waiting and already very active, trying to sabotage it, and it makes it more difficult. Then two weeks later, I was going to Europe. Just to send a message, I went to seven different countries in you know, 12 days time, which means I was, you know, uh, running from one place to another. And then it so happened that uh, uh, be before my trip to the, uh, uh, Europe, I met an ambassador and the uh, director of the Asia division from their foreign ministry. And she said, oh, Lopsang, so you are coming to our country? And I said, no, not this time. I'm going to seven other countries. Oh, Chinese ambassador already came and warned me not to meet you. So I was not even planning to go to that country, <laughs> but warning was already issued. And then I said, okay, then I must come as soon as possible. So will you meet me? She said, yes, she will meet me. Um, but then I'll be going this, this, this year though. So seven countries I went, mainly because, you know, increasing case self emulations is mainly because sense of hopelessness. People give up their life when they feel hopeless. So you have to give them hope. And hope is, you know, different countries issue a, even issue a statement or pass resolution 
showing concern, sends a message of hope, and that hopefully give them you know, reason to live a little longer. Uh, so, in short, it's been more than 100 days. So this is what I've been doing. And uh, now quickly, when as a Tibetan administration, it's based in Dharamsala. It runs like any other government. We have a uh, Department of Int Information and International Relations, uh, which runs about, which, you know, uh, uh, has an ex about, uh, we have around 11 SAMA embassies or offices of Tibet around the world, um, under which we have uh, uh, publication, uh, Chinese decks, environmental decks, human rights decks, which reaches out, which, you know, reach out to uh, different uh, relevant organizations around the world. And education department runs about 70 plus schools. I studied in the refuge, one of the refugee schools run by the education department. And religion and culture department oversees about 250 monasteries and nunneries, India, Nepal, and Bhutan. Um, so it runs like you know, any other government. We have about 600 full-time uh, staff members, uh, 1,100 uh, additional uh, 500 part-time contract-based uh, staff members. So uh, it runs like any other government. Now, I want to touch briefly, because democracy and exile, the case of Tibet, I gave you the personal aspect of the uh, topic. More at a theoretical level, uh, it becomes very complex. Because on the one hand, it's a freedom movement. On the other hand, it's a uh, democratic government. So there is a theoretical contradiction between the two. Because if it's a freedom movement, what you really need is unity, single leadership, and single voice. Because it's a freedom movement. You know, single voice for your freedom, and single leader so that you all you know, there's a clear-cut um, streamlining of leadership, and then uh, unity is paramount. Now, on the other hand, if it's democratic, there's a theoretical contradiction because it's not unity, it's diversity. It's not single leadership, but opposition is very much a part of democratic system. And in a single voice, there has to be free speech. So in some, in some sense, there is a direct contradiction between what a freedom movement should be based on and what a democratic government should be based on. So it looks like theoretically ir irreconcilable. Now on a practical basis, because Tibetan government exile or the Tibetan administration is one of the very unique case which, uh, which doesn't have any role model or model to see. But this is the only effective exile administration which is functioning like any other government. And we are trying to combine the two. So on a daily basis, there are challenges. Uh, for example, at ideological level, you need democracy. Because let's say China is authoritarian, it's communist. So ideological competition is or contrast is democracy. So we stand for democracy, so, which is in direct contrast to. Uh, China's authoritarian communist system. Theoretically, it makes sense. But practically, when you allow free speech, when you allow diversity, when you allow opposition, it, it creates space for uh, intrusion and intervention from outside forces, including China, to you know, uh, use uh, media, people, to create disunity, to sabotage, to intimidate. So democracy provides that platform for others to come in. So ideologically, it makes sense. But practically, at a functional level, there are day-to-day -day challenges. So how you do that? Uh, and then some people also say, what we cherish is unity. Because freedom movement is paramount. Unity is more important. So we don't need free speech. We don't need diversity. We need just single voice. So we have to give up democracy for a freedom movement. Now. If you have to choose between unity and diversity, what would you choose? If you have to choose between your freedom and democracy, freedom movement and democratic government, which one would you choose? So on a daily basis, you have to struggle. Now if you choose one over other, then, uh, 
the ramification consequences are complex and many. If you try to choose both on a daily basis, you can't say, I am a leader, you have to listen to me at the same time, you know. I believe in free speech as long as you don't criticize me. That's not going to work, you know. So how you balance it? So in a daily basis, the democracy in exile, the case of Tibet, uh, is, 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 uh, is dynamic, it's complex, it's interesting and exciting, and very challenging as well. And if you look at other democratic or exiled governments, or exiled movements organizations from Spanish government to uh, Kurdish uh, government exile, to Uyghur exile organization, to Burmese, so they have different setups. Some functions like an organization, some are just a uh, few people, some just has one room, some have, you know, uh, functions like a government. Some succeed, some fail. Uh, so there are a lot of cases, and if you study the Second World War, there are many countries in Europe had the governments in exile in, uh, in London. Um, so it's very uh, interesting, at the same time very challenging as well. Now, I think I saw in the uh, brochure also, uh, there was a quote from His Holiness Dalai Lama. On August 8th, when I took over, His Holiness Dalai Lama made that statement. Um, he said, when he was young, the political authority was handed over to him by then Regent Tara Rinpoche. Today I'm handing over to young, democratic elected Lopsang Senge. And this has been his long cherished goal. So this, I think, is important in the context of Arab, Sp Arab Spring uh, and generally. Because, in, as you witness in Syria, even now, uh, the leadership uh, is you know, shooting at people and killing its own people just to be in power. And Gaddafi, reluctantly, after, after a lot of violence, uh, was in fact shot uh, to force him out of power. Uh, ben Ali of Tunisia, according to some reports, left after two weeks of protest, uh, but with plain load of cash and gold. Um, and then Mubarak refused to go. Uh, now he's hospitalized and he's in deep uh, trouble. But still, leaders refuse to go, hold on to power. But we have a leader like His Holiness who says, you know, 50 years is enough, I'm giving up all my political authority. Just like that. And this, what is important is, institution of Dalai Lama has been in power since 1642. Now, nearly 400 years of institution changed just like that on August 8th. Voluntarily, as he says, willingly and happily. Because he had this vision of demo secular democratic society the year he came to India. Very first year in 1959, he said, we must have a parliament. People should vote and elect, mem uh, elect uh, members of parliament. And we did in 1960. Uh, September 2nd is celebrated as Democracy Day in our community because that's when the first parliament was uh, established. Uh, and then in 1963, we had our constitution. Tibetan constitution, in which His Holiness Dalai Lama insisted there be a provision for his own impeachment that the you know, parliament and other bodies could, by majority vote, could impeach him. Now, in 1963, can you imagine? It started from 1961, formalized in 1963. Tibetans just lost their country and they are in exile. And first thing His Holiness Dalai Lama says is there should be a provision to impeach me. It became a big scandal. Protests erupted. So how can it? It's, it's like... It's blasphemy to think like that, but he insisted, because even I have to be subservient to the Constitution. And by 1963 also, of the 13 members of parliament, we have three women uh, members of parliament. Two decades before, Switzerland had their own women representation in their parliament. So by 1991, we expanded the parliament, the charter was drafted, um, and then uh, by 2001, we had the first direct election of the Kalun Tripa, uh, but he was a very renowned figure, Samdur Rinpoche. He won by 90 plus uh, percent of votes without contesting. He didn't have to go to even a single Tibetan settlement. He got 90 plus percent of votes because for 10 years he was the Speaker of the Tibetan Parliament. By his reputation, by his seniority, he got the vote. This time, in 2011, it was competitive. Uh, election, so that's why 
candidates had to run from settlement to settlement, from country to country, continent to continent. When I said the Tibetan democratic election, the final election was, uh, was on March 20th. For example, in Ladakh, the border of Tibet, it was minus 40 degrees. If you do Google search, you'll find photographs of local election officials carrying ballot boxes on the backs of yaks, carrying to the mountain top so that nomads can come down from the tents for a few hours and vote. In Bandra, I think it's in Chhattisgarh, but the Maharashtra, the state capital is Chhattisgarh, right? Near Nagpur. Of course, Maharashtra, which state, the newly created state of Maharashtra? Hmm? Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh, yeah. Bandra is very, 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 it is 40 plus degrees. And people came and voted. So people from Alaska to Australia, Tibetans, voted on a single day. If you don't vote on the same day, the vote is invalid. And it's all counted locally. The result is sent to Dharamsala. Then they declare results. Uh, so April 27 was the day the result was declared, and I got elected. And on August 8, the, I uh, took over the inauguration day. He solemnly made a, sta uh, a statement. When he was young, the political authorities handed over to him. Today, I'm handing over to Lopsang Sangi. This has been his long cherished goal. For 50 years, step by step by step, his solemnly Dalai Lama's vision of secular democracy, democracy system was established and realized on August 8th. And jokingly, he told media also, <clears throat> on August 8th night, I think he was on Barkhad Das show, Bark Stops here, just a few days ago, and in which he said, oh, I slept unusually very well that, that night, for nine hours, and no, no dreams at all. <laughs> That's what he said. And uh, I wish he said that during the election, that could have saved you know, me time to go to all these places. Um, so, for the last 50 years, Tibetans have invested in democracy and nonviolence. Why international community should care and support? Because we have invested in democracy and nonviolence. If we are not recognized or supported, as far as Tibetans are concerned, we will carry on with nonviolence and democracy. These are the two core principles which we modeled after India, after Gandhi's Ahimsa, which we will keep, you know, uh, believing in and investing in and, and moving forward. But then what happens is that there are other communities and organizations in exile who are also struggling. And when they see this Tibetan administration, which has invested in democracy and nonviolence, is not recognized, not supported, then other communities will feel that perhaps it's not worth investing in democracy and nonviolence. Then resort to some non nonviolent way. Then, then, as you can see, international community rushing to put out the fire whenever there are some conflicts everywhere. There's, oh, the death's happening, there's genocide, crime against humanity, we have to put it out. But it's too late by then. But rather, if you invest now, where it needs to be invested, where, Tibet, where people like Tibetans who believe in democracy and violence, that will be a good model for other exile movements to follow suit. Then if you really want to make 21st century a century of democracy and nonviolence, then you must start recognizing and rewarding you know, uh, movements that believe in investment, uh, that believe in democracy and nonviolence. So we have done that for the last 50 years. So, th so this is one reason why <clears throat> Tibet is an important issue. Quickly, then I'll uh, conclude here, why Tibet is important. Environmentally, Tibet is very, very important for Asia and the world. Ten major rivers of Asia flow from Tibet. We have some Bengalis here. Anyone from Bangladesh? Bengali or Ashe? Ah. Because, uh, and Assam, because the Brahmaputra River, it starts from Tibet. 
and it flows down northeast to Bangladesh. Indus River, the river on which the you know, Indian and Pakistan civilization started, it starts from Tibet. Not just starts from Tibet, actually almost 60% of Indus River water is a fresh water that melts from the uh, Tibetan mountains. Mekong River, which flows all the way to Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, starts from Tibet. Yellow River, where the Chinese civilization was founded. Yangtze River and the Yangtze Dams starts from Tibet. So essentially, Tibetan river, actually rivers which starts from Tibet, provide you know, uh, water to 47 or nearly 50% of the world population. If you take India, China, add Bangladesh, and Pakistan, you're almost there. Then add you know, Thailand, Vietnam, and Laos. So Tibet is very, very important. And also, Tibet also has the third largest reserve of ice after Antarctica and Arctic. That's what Tibet is called, the third pole. Obviously, Antarctica and Arctic, ice melts and goes to ocean. But Tibet, it, flow, it, you know, it flows through different countries. And then, given the delicate nature of Tibet's environment, the plateau, roof of the world, the jet stream above Tibet affects the climate all the way to Peru in Latin America. So Tibet is environmentally very, very important. And from civilization point of view, uh, Tibet has preserved the Buddhist tradition, or this, more specifically the Nalanda Buddhist tradition, more or less intact. Tibetan literature is one of the five oldest literature in this entire world. So Tibetans, we don't want to be a museum piece. And from a geopolitical point of view, Tibet is very important. It's in the heart of Central Asia. If you take China, it's East Asia and South Asia. The great game in the early 20th century was fought over Tibet, Afghanistan, and Xinjiang. That's why you have this Afghan issue even now. All these major powers involved uh, in Afghanistan, and you, what you see the result or the consequence even today. So that is why you know, China has built, up to now, six major airports in Tibet, military capacity airports in Tibet. And the railway line has come all the way to Lhasa. They want to extend to Sikkim, bring it to Kathmandu, thereby covering one flank to other flank. And obviously, by extension, China has built seaport in Pakistan. They're building a major one in Sri Lanka. And there's a talk of building one in uh, Burma. And they're investing three to four billion dollars worth of infrastructure in Lumbini, where Buddha was born. Thereby covering the whole of Uttar Pradesh. Before, when Tibet was independent, there was hardly a century post between India and Tibet. After the occupation, with China coming to Tibet, there's a direct face-to-face -face between India and China. Now, according to media reports, Indian media reports, the military buildup is three to one. So there are 33 regiments from the Chinese side to 13 or so from Indian side. So had Tibet, if Tibet is restored its traditional role, then from environment point of view, we'll respect the natural flow of river, because China is building dams after dams after dams in all the rivers, 20 dams in one river also. Because China has 8% of fresh water but almost 20% of world population. So they need water. India also does. So Brahma Chalani has come up with a new book which says that 
19th century, wars were fought over land. Now in 20th century, wars are fought uh, over energy. But 21st century, wars will be fought over water. And Tibet will be in the heart of Asia. So environmentally also, Tibet is very, very important. Geopolitically very important. And uh, politically also, as I mentioned, we have invested in democracy and nonviolence. Uh, very, very important. So, with that, uh, let me uh, conclude by saying, you know, obviously, I'm sure this question will be asked. Before you ask me this question, let me answer, at least give you the context of the answer. So often I'm asked, realistically sometimes they say, sometimes they say, rationally, do you think you'll gain your freedom? Sometimes they'll say, in your lifetime, or for Tibet. Rationally, that's the key word. And I often say, I'm not in rational choice theory business. I'm in irrational choice theory business. So irrationally, I do think freedom will be restored in Tibet and His Holiness the Dalai Lama will return to Tibet. I base this uh, belief because if you look at world history, just before Soviet Union collapsed, all the rational choice theories or the scientists or political scientists didn't predict the collapse of the Soviet Union or the Berlin Wall or the color revolution and recently Arab Spring. So the world is filled with irrational theories and I am part of the irrational. So that's why I left Harvard Law School after 16 years. I gave up my job there and I gave up uh, America to come to India and to a beautiful town called Dharamsala. It's a beautiful hill station but it's chillingly cold now. Now, without central heating, I mean, Raj, we have done a good job, you know, providing AC to all the facilities here. Uh, up in Dharamsal, there's no central heating. But it's irrational to move from America to here, from Harvard to here. But I'm an irrational choice to a business. This is the movement Tibetan people ought to have ownership, and I am a Tibetan, and I'm proud to be born as one and proudly die as one. While I live, I'll, for, I'll fight for freedom for Tibetan people. Thank you very much.